Jakob Hazard, and he's an attorney with Robbins, Kaplan, Miller, and Creasy, and he's going to discuss licensing and royalties. Who owns you? And he's going to educate us as far as uh, what our rights are. Good afternoon, everybody. We're just waiting for the PowerPoint here to get fired up. Oh, no worries. Thank you. Um, well, first, uh, again, good afternoon, and I'd like to begin by saying it's really an honor uh, to be here and to have an opportunity to address uh, all of you. Uh, I've spent many Sunday mornings uh, and afternoons watching you guys do great work on the field, and uh, I'm a true fan, that's for sure. I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Dave and Robert for the opportunity uh, and, and, the chance to and the chance to address all of you here today. So what I'm, the title of our uh, program here is Who Owns You? And what I want to talk about are uh, the rights that each of you has and that your uh, heirs may have with respect to ownership of your persona, your name, your likeness, your voice, your signature, et cetera. And the primary, Robert, the, the primary uh, doctrine we're going to talk about today is a law called the right of publicity. And you hear a lot about the right of publicity when it relates to celebrities and, and the uh, onslaught of the paparazzi in today's modern society. Um, and, and that's what we're talking about here. So who am I? Let's start with that. Um, I'm the uh, co-chair of the Entertainment and Media Group at Robbins, Kaplan, Miller, and Cerisi. Uh, I've been practicing law since 1990, primarily in the entertainment field, which is why I get to come, although I wear a suit, I don't have to wear a tie because I'm an entertainment lawyer. Uh, <laughs> and I've represented a number of clients over the years, including uh, uh, the estates of Ray Charles and Sammy Davis Jr., uh, the, the rapper Snoop, uh, the recording artist and actor Jamie Foxx, the rock band Weezer. I've also represented a number of athletes over the years. And kind of a funny story, when I was a young lawyer, um, we had a case for the basketball player Sam Perkins, who had just joined the Lakers at the time. And Sam had... Uh, purchased a home or open escrow on a home and decided to back out of it because he didn't like the, he learned that the neighborhood wasn't as good as he thought it was. And so he got sued. And so the agent retained our law firm to represent Sam and we were having a problem, or at least the partner in the case, I was a young associate and they couldn't reach Sam. And um, you know, they, they would leave messages through his agent, they would leave messages at his home, they would try his cell phone and finally the partner called me and says, is there anything you can do to help me get in touch with Sam? We have to talk to him, we need to respond to this lawsuit. I said, sure. I'll go to practice tomorrow and uh, check about it because, you know, I had that access because most important about my background is that I am the son of Walt Hazard, a former professional athlete. So I had a little bit of access to the Laker locker room and was able to get there and, and get the case handled for Sam. So you're wondering with that background, how, did, how is it that I became a lawyer? Well, we have a saying in my house, it must have skipped a generation because the basketball talent I, I didn't acquire, uh, <laughs> at least not well enough to make a living out of it. I, you know, I gave it a stab in college for a little while, then blew out my knee, and then here I am. Um, but like I said, it may have skipped a generation. So my oldest son's a freshman at, on the team at the University of Arizona, the, the Wildcats, not a bad program. And then my youngest son is a sophomore in high school who's uh, you know, being pretty heavily recruited and you know, actually is really contemplating going to Kyle Berkeley, which really pains me as a, <laughs> as a graduate of Stanford. Um, <laughs> so I told him his mother will have to sign that letter, right? <laughs> in any event, there are a number of uh, different legal doctrines that pre protect what we call the publicity interests, right? And your publicity interests are your name, voice, your signature, your photograph, your likeness, and your persona, 
and we'll talk about that uh, as we talk about some of the cases moving forward. And there are really four legal doctrines that, that uh, come into play here. There are some, case, uh, some states have enacted specific statutes uh, for the right of publicity. California is an example. Uh, most states have created what they call a common law uh, publicity right that's a little bit broader than the, the statutes typically are and protect unauthorized use of more than just the mere name, voice, signature, et cetera. You know, then you have some other legal doctrines. I don't want to get too technical, but you've got trademark law. And the reason trademark law comes into play in this regard is because when you start talking about false endorsement, where someone is using your image or your name to falsely imply that you're endorsing a product or a good or a service, that implicates issues under trademark law. So there's a little bit of an overlap there. And then there's this kind of more amorphous idea of unfair competition law, which crosses over all of the other three in certain respects when it comes to these particular issues. Um, but again, we're here today to talk primarily about the so-called right of publicity. Um, the right of publicity, as indicated on this slide, is purely a function of state law and a creature of state law. It's something that was developed at the state level as opposed to the federal level. Right? Trademark laws at, at a federal level, rights of publicity are at the state level. So there are a number of states that have what they call common law publicity rights. That means that the judge made the law through a particular case as opposed to the state legislature you know, writing an actual uh, statute to protect or, or to codify, as we say, the law. So as of right now, at least 21 states have expressly recognized the right of publicity. And those states are Alabama, Arizona, California, Connecticut, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Illinois, Kentucky, Michigan, Minnesota, uh, Missouri, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, West Virginia, and Wisconsin. That means if you are a resident of one of these states, then you have publicity rights that have been created through the common law, that is judge-made uh, publicity rights that you are entitled to enforce. If you, live in, if you don't live in one of those states, but a defendant or someone does live, uh, op live or d conducts business out of one of those states and they use your image, you might be able, even if you live in a state that doesn't have an express common law right of publicity, go to Arizona or California where the defendant is located and still assert a claim under the law of uh, the state where the defendant resides. Now, the common law right of publicity um, is, is a broad, a relatively broad law, and in order to establish a violation of your rights under this law, you need to approve the following elements. One, that the defendant use your identity, usually undisputed. Second, that the uh, use was to the defendant's advantage or otherwise, and that's usually also not disputed. There's a reason that they're using it. It's because they want to take advantage of it. Lack of consent, they did it without your permission. And finally, resulting injury, which is usually also not very disputed in a lot of these cases. Now, in addition to the common law, oh, let me back up. Now, the common law right of publicity, like I said, is relatively broad, and it's certainly much broader than the statutory rights of publicity that certain states have enacted. And it has been construed to uh, protect the unauthorized use of your persona. Okay, well, what's a persona? Well, I'm, there's going to be a case that's going to have an example of it, but it's been construed so broadly that Vanna White from the Wheel of Fortune television show was able to successfully sue an advertising company for using a robot that was potentially her. And the, the way it came up was the, the um, I think it was Sanyo did a commercial, and it was, uh, you know, what the, the future would look like. And what they were doing was they showed what the Wheel of Fortune show would look like, you know, 50 years from now. And instead of having Vanna White turning the letters, they had a robot, right, with a wig. And the court said that was enough to uh, invoke the 
uh, image or persona of Vanna White such that she could sue them for violating her common law rights of publicity. So it's a relatively broad concept under the law um, that you should be aware of. Now, as I mentioned, there are a number of states that have, um, oh, that's just a case citation for you, uh, for you, for you lawyers in the audience. Uh, the next slide, please. As I mentioned, there are a number, number of states that have enacted specific statutes uh, with respect to the right of publicity. Uh, and those states are California, Florida, Indiana, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Nebraska, Nevada, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Virginia, Washington, and Wisconsin. Now, in states that have enacted a specific statute, that, is, that does not replace or displace the common law rights. Most of these states also recognize a common law right of publicity. And so what happens, and often, oftentimes when I represent celebrities who've had their uh, publicity rights violated, I'll bring a claim both under the common law and under the statutory uh, law of a particular state where the celebrity resides. Now, although you can bring two claims, you don't get to get two recoveries. However, you have alternative theories, and there are some advantages uh, and disadvantages to bringing a claim under one of the, the specific statutes that uh, one of the states has enacted. One of those advantages, and it can be a disadvantage, is that, for example, in California, and we can turn to the next slide, um, the California statute, while it's not quoted here, has an attorney's fees provision for the prevailing party. So if you've got a close case, right, where it's not so clear that you're going to win because maybe the defendant has a valid defense, then what I counsel clients to do is to assert a claim under the common law, but not under the statute, to avoid the risk of being hit with attorney's fees in the event that a judge or a jury disagrees uh, that the defendant's conduct was unlawful. Now, the statutory right of publicity, and this is an example from California, which is where I practice, is, is a little bit narrower. Uh, it's narrow in a couple of respects. One, it covers a person who knowingly uses another's name or likeness. So there is a, an element of uh, knowledge that you have to prove on behalf of the defendant that you don't have to prove if you re recall the slide on the common law. You have to uh, prove under a common law claim. The other thing is that it, it's, it lists the things that uh, the defendant can't do, and they can't use your name, your voice, your signature, your photograph, or your likeness on or in products or for advertising those products. So in the, the case I described involving Vanna White and the Wheel of Fortune, she would not be able to establish a claim under the California statute because her actual name, her actual voice, her actual signature, her actual photograph, and her actual likeness were not used. It was a robot that invoked her, uh, her persona, but it, did, it was not one of those five specific things. Now, certain states have also recognized rights of publicity for deceased people. Um, and without getting too technical in the law, as a general rule, claims that, uh, for, uh, that implicate privacy rights, defamation, false light, those kind of things, those are usually considered by the law to be personal to the individual. And those personal type of privacy claims die when the individual dies, right? But the right of publicity, while it started initially in some places as stemming from the so-called right of privacy, many of the uh, states and the courts have recognized that it's really nowadays more of a property right. It's more akin to a trademark right, than it is to a defamation claim. And as a result, in those states where the right of publicity is viewed as a property right, uh, the, the uh, legislature uh, in most cases, and sometimes the judges have uh, ruled that those property rights, i.e. publicity rights, uh, do survive after death and uh, do descend to uh, the heirs of the individual whose publicity rights are being used without permission. The key is you have to live in one of these states in order for that to qualify at the time that you die. Okay, so you, if, if, if the individual uh, resides in one of the states that are on the board at the time that they die, then their heirs have a right of publicity. Um, that's become very clear now. 
it varies from state to state. For example, in uh, California, I believe it's 70 years. In New York, it's 50. Oh, excuse me, not New York. In, um, I believe it is Indiana, it's 50. And this has been a hot topic uh, recently, and the, uh, the, the, the main cases that have dealt with this issue involve the estate of Marilyn Monroe. And if you saw, I used her as the, as the image in, in one of the opening slides. Marilyn Monroe, uh, her publicity rights are controlled by a company out of Indiana. Um, she was bi-coastal during most of her life, right? She split her time between New York and California. And when she died, in order to avoid California estate taxes, right, the, they probated her estate in New York, taking the position that she was a resident of New York at the time that she died. Fast forward now to just a couple years ago, um, there was a lawsuit brought by this company that controls her publicity rights in California against some photographers who were exploiting images of her uh, without this company's permission. And the photographers actually fought back and they said, well, wait a minute. We don't think that there's a, a, right of publi a post-mortem, as they call it, right of publicity for Marilyn Monroe because she was a resident of New York when she died. And New York, if you, you know, on the previous slide you saw, was not one of the states listed up there. The Indiana company argued, no, no, um, either Indiana law should apply because that's where we're located, or California law should apply because we all know that Marilyn Monroe spent a lot of time in California. She lived in a bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel. In fact, I think that's where she was found uh, dead. Well, the court said to the uh, Indiana company, said, you don't get to pick and choose where she died depending on whether you're trying to avoid estate taxes as you did back when she died and chose New York or now when you're trying to enforce a publicity right as you're doing right now. And so the court found that um, she was uh, stopped from, from claiming that she was a California resident at the time that she died and therefore because she was a, instead a resident of New York and therefore there's no postmortem right of publicity, you're out of court. So something to keep in mind. Now, what do you get uh, for a violation of your publicity rights? Well, the first thing that you get are your actual damages, right? And you say, well, maybe I wasn't really damaged. I mean, I didn't, it's not like I had to take my car into the shop to get it repaired or anything like that. Well, the actual damages that we're talking about are what the defendant would have had to pay you for the right to use your likeness or your name or your voice or your signature. And that's usually uh, valued in the terms of what they call a reasonable license fee, right? What a willing buyer and a willing seller would agree in the open market, that right is worth. The second thing you're entitled to are the profits or the unjust enrichment to the defendant attributable to the unauthorized use of your name, likeness, image, et cetera. Um, it's a very powerful uh, uh, remedy that you're entitled to seek there because most of the cases uh, and most of the statutes don't require you to prove what portion of the profits the defendant made from the use is attributable to the violation of your publicity rights. So for example, if they uh, uh, use your photo um, without permission on a product that they sell, then all the defendant, or excuse me, all the, you have to do as the plaintiff is say, okay, my photo was on the, the product. You sold 100 of those products for $50 each. 50 times 100, that's my damages. That, or those are the profits that you've earned unlawfully. And then it's the defendant's burden to say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Not all of the uh, profits are attributable to the fact that it was your image on there. There are some other things that went into uh, the motivating people to buy this particular poster. And then they'll try to you know, chisel it down They'll say, and it also cost us all this money to make the posters and to ship them and to market and advertise them. Um, but that's, you know, when I'm representing a defendant in that position, that's not a very uh, fun place to be. The next thing that you're entitled to get are attorney's fees and costs. As I mentioned earlier, that's usually when you bring a claim under one of the state statutes. If it's a common law claim, you're not entitled to your attorney's fees. You may be entitled to your court costs, but that's, you know, the $100 filing fee that you have to give the, the court when you submit your complaint. It's nothing really significant. Um, but like I said, you, know, you have to be careful uh, with this issue because if you've got, like I said, a close case, 
then you want to avoid doing anything that might make either side entitled to attorney's fees. In fact, um, Kim Kardashian learned that lesson uh, the hard way not too long ago. Um, she filed a lawsuit against someone who, um, against an advertiser because they used someone in the ad that she claimed looked like her. It was a Kim Kardashian lookalike, right? They had asked Kim to do the commercial she had passed. So they went out and got some other singer, happened to be a Latin woman, who I didn't think looked much like Kim Kardashian, but I guess Kim did. And so Kim filed a lawsuit, and she made the mistake of not only suing under common law, but she sued under the statute. And the court quickly threw her case out, saying, no, no, I mean, no one's going to really think that this is you, Kim. I mean, you know, a lot of people resemble one another, but she doesn't really look like you that much. I think they actually said she looked more like Eva Longoria than uh, Kim Kardashian. But in any event, as a result of bringing that statutory claim, Kim was forced to pay the other side's attorney's fees when the court threw her case out. Then the last item that you're entitled to seek in these kinds of claims are what they call punitive damages. And, and those are uh, damages that are imposed by the judge or the jury for the purpose of punishing the defendant for, the, for their bad conduct in an effort to send a message not only to the defendant but to the rest of the world that you know, that type of conduct won't be tolerated and that there will be a price to pay if you engage in the similar conduct in the future. Now, what are the defenses that uh, get raised in these kinds of cases? Well, most of them are First Amendment-based defenses. Um, the first one and the most obvious one um, and usually successful one is what they call news accounts and commentary, right? That's where your name or pictures in the sports page the Monday morning after you played the game and it's just a, an account of what happened during the game the day before. Or it's a, you know, Bill Plasky or whoever, pick your sports columnist writing a column uh, about uh, your performance or the coach's performance or the team's performance. Those types of uh, uses are usually um, protected. That's called news accounts and commentary, right? That's kind of the traditional, when you think of the First Amendment, right, you think of that. The next uh, First Amendment related defense is what they call expressive artistic works. That's where your rights are used in a book or in an, uh, a, a movie or a television show, some creative uh, artistic expressive work uh, that raises First Amendment protection issues. Not absolute, not as absolute as the news account, but a defense that a defendant has nonetheless. Uh, the third, and this is where it gets a, a little difficult to comprehend sometimes, is what they call transformative uses. That is where someone, it usually comes into play in, in, with artists, and we're going to talk about cases that touch upon all these defenses uh, in a few moments, but that is where uh, someone uses the image to create a piece of art where the product, the courts say, are so transformed that it is the defendant's expression rather than the celebrity's likeness. It's a situation where the work that's the subject of the lawsuit is something more than simply a literal redepiction of the person. So what you have in these kinds of cases, you have on one extreme uh, situations where someone, uh, an artist, draws a drawing of a celebrity and it's simply a drawing of the celebrity and they sell it. Well, that's typically not considered a transformative use by the courts because all you're doing is, you know, if it were a photograph, right, there'd be no dispute that, there, that there, you'd have a claim. Well, this is just a substitute, a direct substitute for that photograph. However, if you take someone, and this is a real case, you take a celebrity's image and use it as the basis for a comic book character, say you're a hockey player named Tony Twist, and a comic book company comes out with a comic book that has a, a character in it that's clearly and obviously based upon you, Tony Twist, but the character's got horns and he wears a cape and he's got superpowers and all those kinds of things. Well, the courts have found in those types of cases that that's a, quote, transformative use of, the, of Tony Twist's image that's entitled to First Amendment protection. Okay. Then I put up here life stories um, because there's a, a, a misnomer, and I deal with this with my clients all the time, that 
you have an exclusive right to your life story, right? I've got life story rights. Well, there's really, it's really a misnomer. There's really no uh, such thing as exclusive life story rights, uh, which is why you see oftentimes unauthorized biographies, right? And there's no lawsuit brought by the person who's the subject of the biography. You just kind of have to, to, to bear down and, and deal with it. So now that I've kind of laid the framework of an overview of the law, let's talk about a few cases that have, uh, 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 that have been brought that involve athletes. And hopefully each of these cases will remind you of one of the things that I've just discussed uh, to, uh, up to this point. So the first is a case called Matzenbacher versus R.J. Reynolds Tobacco. And in this case, what you had was Lofar Matzenbacher was a, a race car driver, and he had customized his car, all of his cars, his fleet of cars that he raced in, to a point where they really became associated with him. Right? If you saw that car, you knew it was a Matzenberger car. Right? He had you know, special stylized things, and, and it was clearly identifiable with him, and it clearly distinguished him and his car from um, the other uh, drivers. And so Winston Cigarettes, without any permission, took a photo of Monsenbarger driving the car, uh, changed the number of the car from number 11 to number 71, that's why it's got a big circle there, and then put on the tail the Winston logo. Well, Monsenbarger wasn't happy and brought a lawsuit against Winston, and Winston defended the case uh, and saying, well, what are you talking about? You're not even recognizable in this photograph. It's a, it's a, it's a car. It's not you, the individual. It's, it's, it's the car that you drive. So we have no liability. We're not using your publicity rights. Well, the uh, court disagreed with Winston and found under the common law right of publicity, right, that um, the use of the photo of the car in the TV commercial did invoke Matzenberger's persona because that people would immediately think that that's Matzenberger driving the car in the helmet. And therefore, um, Matzenberger did have a claim against Winston, and it was going to be up to the jury to decide whether or not this conduct by Winston violated Matzenberger's rights under the right of publicity laws. Now, a lot of these slides are going to say claim allowed to go to the jury. And what that means is that the defendant was unsuccessful in convincing the judge to throw the case out at one stage or another, and that the court had decided that whatever the defense or the argument that the defendant was making uh, was entitled to be decided by the jury because there were, there were disputed facts or disputed issues that the judge couldn't decide as a matter of law. That doesn't mean necessarily that Matzenberger went to trial and the jury found in his favor. It just meant that he was entitled to take his case before a jury. And when you get to that point, I can tell you as someone who's been doing this for 20 plus years, the defendant often settles. Is that what happened in that case? Yes. It's a good, that's what's going to happen in almost every one of these cases that you're going to see. And, and typically the settlements are going to be confidential. <laughs> Right. <laughs> they'll be confidential, so all that will happen is that the case will be dismissed. Maybe there'll be a statement released by the party saying the case has been amicably resolved, uh, but you'll never know how much money Winston paid Matzenberger. That's typically how a lot of these cases are settled, especially almost all these cases involve well-known celebrity type people, and as a result, almost every settlement that gets reached uh, in these kinds of cases contain confidentiality provisions. So, we talked about news accounts and commentary. Well, here's a case, Montana versus San Jose Mercury News. Now, I can tell you as a lawyer, as soon as I see the, that it's the San Jose Mercury News on the, that side of the V, I know it's going to be a tough case for Montana, right? Because that's a media defendant, and media defendants, particularly newspapers, are viewed by the courts as being the classic First Amendment candidate. So what happened in this case? The newspaper had run a story about the 49ers, uh, which included, you know, photos of Joe Montana. Well, they decided, you know, this, everyone's so excited about the 49ers' success. Let's take that article. Let's make it into a poster and let's sell the poster. 
and we'll give away the poster along with the newspaper. And if you buy it, if you subscribe for the paper, you get a free poster. And Montana said, well, wait a minute. Now that's, you're taking a little bit too far. And he brought a lawsuit against them. And um, the court, he brought a lawsuit both under the, the statute and under the common law in California. And so the court said, well, you know, we got a media defendant here. It's a newspaper. The original story was clearly a First Amendment protected use, right? It was a news account of the game or a story about the 49ers. And there's no question that, that was First Amendment protected. And the court said, and the poster is simply a reproduction of that same First Amendment protected story. So even though the newspaper is selling these things and they're making money off of it, we're going to say that they're allowed to do so without Joe Montana's permission because of the First Amendment. A little bit of a surprising uh, decision in my view, but like I said, I usually represent folks like you guys against the, the, the uh, uh, unauthorized users of the publicity rights. So there's an example of the news account commentary really kind of going a long ways uh, to protect the defendant. The next case is Abdul Jabbar versus General Motors. You can see the, on, the, on the other side of the V here, you don't have a newspaper, you've got a, a car company. So a little bit better case for the plaintiff. Here, the uh, General Motors ran a television commercial during the NC2A tournament, and it had a trivia question. And the answer to the trivia question was Lou Alcindor, right, who was the only player to win three MVPs in a row in the NC2A. I forgot what the question was, but the answer was Lou Alcindor. Well, Kareem, who at this point hadn't been known as Lou Alcindor for 10, 15 years, filed a lawsuit against General Motors, uh, saying that that was a violation of his common law right of publicity. Again, he didn't really have a statutory claim because Lou Alcindor is no longer his actual name. And, and Kareem's image photo did not appear in the commercial. So he brought a claim under the common law. General Motors argued that there was no violation of Kareem's rights for a couple of reasons. They said, one, Kareem's no longer known as Lou Alcindor. He changed his name. And so we're not invoking his persona. And secondly, they said, and to the extent that he's claiming uh, some form of rights in the name Lou Alcindor, well, he abandoned that when he changed his name from Lou Alcindor to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in the late 60s. And the court considered the arguments and said, well, you know, not so sure. It's obvious when you, to any viewer who's watching the commercial that you're referring to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar because everyone in the world knows his name used to be Lou Alcindor. He's the answer to the trivia question. And you know what, we're not, you know, us the judges, we're not so sure how a jury would come out on this. So guess what? Kareem gets to take his case in front of a jury and let the jury decide whether or not they believe that the use of the name Lou Alcindor as the answer to the trivia question in that commercial violates Kareem's rights of publicity under the common law. The other thing that the court allowed to uh, go to the jury in that case was a false endorsement claim, right, under the trademark law. Because Kareem said, not only did you use my publicity rights without permission, the way that you're doing this falsely suggests to the viewers that I am a sponsor or have otherwise been paid to endorse G, you know, General Motors products, and that's not the case. You know, I, I charge good money for the, my endorsement rights when I endorse a product or a service, and uh, this is uh, trading freely off my name and in, in endorsement. So, case was allowed to go to the jury. Okay, the next is Gianfrido versus Major League Baseball. This will sound a little bit familiar, I think. Um, the plaintiffs in that case were retired baseball players. The case had started off as a class action, but it ended up for reasons I won't bore you with, not proceeding as a class action. And what you had left standing were four retired baseball players led by a Gianfrido suing Major League Baseball and some other entities uh, for the use of their names, statistics, biographical information uh, in a wide variety of ways, including using clips of them playing, of their images while they were playing, in uh, uh, various, in my view, commercial endeavors, including selling videotapes, right, the greatest moments in Major League Baseball history. 
things like that. And so these plaintiffs brought a lawsuit against Major League Baseball and a number of other defendants. And uh, this is where baseball, I think, has a kind of a special place in the, in the world, at least in the law, uh, because the court decided it had to do a First Amendment balancing analysis, right? They had to weigh the rights of the play, retired players on one hand and the First Amendment protections on the other. And then the court starts waxing poetically about the role in, of baseball in, in, in United States history and, and, and you know, how it's uh, such a important, an important American pastime that's really not owned by anyone but owned by the American people and so on and so forth. And you knew where that was heading when, when they started waxing poetically like that. They found that the First Amendment applied to the conduct here that conveying historical information about baseball was First Amendment protected speech. And then it also, and I think in, a, in my opinion a bit of a stretch, again I'm biased because of where I usually am in these cases, found that all of the conduct at issue was non-commercial speech, right? Now it was one thing for the court, in my opinion, to find that, all right, reprinting the names and statistics of you know, the World Series MVPs in a baseball program is First Amendment protected speech, right? That's one thing. But to extend that all the way to the video clips, I thought, um, you know, kind of began to cross the line a little bit. Uh, but in any event, that's where the court came down on, on that uh, particular case. The court then went on to say, and you know, the other reason this is non-commercial speech in our view is, um, this is not like the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar case. They explicitly talk about that. And they said, this is not the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar case because that's clear commercial speech because that's a commercial, a television commercial for a product. Here, this is not a television commercial or a commercial or an advertiser for anything else. It's the videos themselves. And so that's how the court kind of got around and came to its conclusion that the conduct there did not implicate uh, commercial speech for purposes of the First Amendment. So, ah, the transformative test. Now here we go. This is a case that Tiger Woods brought not too long ago. Um, it involved this particular painting, which is a painting entitled The Masters of, uh, of Augusta. And it was a special uh, poster that this particular artist created commemorating uh, Tiger's 1997 Masters win, right, where he was the youngest person ever to win the Masters, and also won the Masters by the largest uh, margin ever. I think that still stands today. And as you see, it has three images of Woods. It's got him with the follow through and a couple of him staring down and lining up some putts. And Tiger uh, uh, filed a lawsuit against the, the artist, and the artist responded by arguing transformative use under the First Amendment, right? Remember I described transformative use as using, it's like someone takes my face and uses it kind of as the template for a cartoon character or something like that. Well, that was the argument here. And again, a, bit, a little bit surprising to me, the court agreed with the artist and said, yeah, you're right, it is a transformative use. Um, and the court noted, well, yeah, there are these three images of Tiger, but if you look in the background, and it's hard to see, there are a bunch of images of other former uh, or past Masters champions as well. And because of that, this is really kind of an original piece of art. It's not just a literal reproduction of Tiger's image. Um, therefore, I'm going to give the defendant a pass here and find that uh, this is protected under the transformative use test prong of the First Amendment. Now here's another one, NC2A football, video games, EA Sports. Uh, this, this case has an interesting history. Um, it ended up being two cases. It started involving an EA uh, video game for NC2A basketball where Ed O'Bannon filed a lawsuit against uh, the NC2A and others. And he was really alleging antitrust violations in, I don't want to get too bogged down in that, but he had an antitrust claim saying that it was, that the NC2A was a monopoly and they didn't have the right to do what they were doing. Uh, but then there were a couple of other cases filed uh, involving this, this football game. Uh, one was a case called Keller versus EA Sports out in California, Federal Circuit Court in California. Uh, the other 
other, uh, uh, on the other coast in New Jersey was brought by a gentleman named Hart. And so you have parallel cases going involving uh, plaintiffs suing, making the exact same claims involving the exact same video game on two different coasts. And the video game you know, replicated all the N uh, NC2A football teams and all the members of those teams. Um, I think this, was two, this one is 2010. And th it really captured every distinctive characteristic of the football players with the exception of their names. So um, if you wore your wristband up on your elbow when you played, well, the version of you in this game had the wristband up on the elbow. Um, you know, if you wore a special kind of face mask, well, the video game had you wearing that special kind of face mask. Um, I mean, it was really down to, to you know, every little detail. I, I, like I said, with the exception of any name on the back of the jersey or identifying a particular player as being a, or identifying a character in the game as being really a particular player. Um, funny story about two years ago, uh, my two sons were playing this version of uh, the basketball game, EA Basketball, and they have a way where you can go in and you can pick uh, older teams. And so I guess they were playing around one day and they decided to be UCLA 1964 team, right? John Wooden's first team. And you know, my sons, they know who my father you know, was and that he was a great player, but they don't know the, the precise history. And so they're watching, they're playing the game and all of a sudden my youngest son runs and goes, Dad, we're playing this game, it's Papa. They had actually found him, his image, his, right? It didn't have his name, but they knew it was him right away. Uh, and so they were playing this game, you know, and, and my, my father's image was in the game without permission, I might add. In any event, so you got these two cases going on different coasts. You have the exact same uh, uh, an argument being made, the exact same game being analyzed, and look at this. The courts come down with opposite results. California, right, being more uh, celebrity friendly, right, home of Hollywood, used to uh, vindicating rights of celebrities, protecting them from abuses. They find in favor of the athletes rejecting the argument that this constitutes a transformative First Amendment use. Meanwhile, in New Jersey, and I won't defame New Jersey, then it's, it's not here to defend itself, the court accepts the, the, the very argument that the California court rejected and finds in favor of EA Sports. Now, both cases are on appeal, and, you know, we're hopeful that at some point in time, one of, you know, and maybe this is the case, it gets brought to the uh, U.S. Supreme Court and they, you know, settle this issue once and for all, because video games are really giving the courts a lot of problems these days. Some judges... I think the older judges don't view video games really as being that worthy of First Amendment protection, right? They don't consider a video game to be in the same class as a movie or a book. Uh, you, know, you can debate whether that's right or wrong. Um, whereas other courts think that, you know, well, you know, video games are the new books, right? And so they're as entitled to as much First Amendment protection as other traditional uh, uh, media. So it'll be interesting to see how this, this case plays out, but uh, I wanted to come here and just give you a little bit of an, uh, a run through and kind of a, uh, a summary of what your rights are, what the right of publicity law is all about, uh, what the different defenses are uh, that are raised, how those defenses play out in real life cases, um, and how sometimes you can have different results involving the exact same facts. So now I'm here to answer any question anyone has, but two rules or two things. Not about the driver's NFL case, because that's tomorrow. Um, but if anyone has any more general questions. Yeah, this is the teaser. You have the warm-up act. <laughs> but there'll be a spirited debate tomorrow about uh, uh, that, that issue. And so I'm just here to kind of lay the, lay the framework and the groundwork so that you understand what the issues are when you hear that debate. Yes, Rob.
is that part of the settlement? They should be getting royalty check for a future game. You're right. I guess what I'm curious on is that this is four years later, and Madden football, they brought out another game and another game and another game over the last four years, and yet retired players, I haven't heard of retired players getting any more checks. Why not? You know, I, I, I'm not familiar with the, the terms of that specific settlement and whether or not that settlement included uh, giving EA the rights to make subsequent games using the uh, players' images, and if so, under what terms? whether there was a royalty they'd have to pay, whether there was a one-time payment as a buyout of those rights, I don't know. Um, there was a similar case involving the retired NBA players, and I do know that, because my mother mentioned it to me the other day, that uh, royalty checks from those types of uses have been coming to them. Um, but it just depends on what the terms of that settlement were. I, 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 yeah. Yeah, that yeah, it just be. seems that you know, with Major League Baseball, they continue to get royalties. Yeah. Uh, basketball, they do. Football, they don't. Yeah, I'd have to look at the terms of the settlement. Which also brings up the question, um, why did the money come away? Does that show anything that would happen from those games, that things and things like that end up ending upon his death, or would that continue on to the air? And so that's kind of what you're talking about. Where did your husband live when he passed away? California. Then, then it, you, will, you should continue to get the checks. You still have the rights. Um, under the California statute, you have to uh, register, file certain forms with the California Secretary of State. Uh, I don't know if you've done that or are familiar with that, and I can help you with that if you'd like. Um, it's a relatively straightforward form that you file with the California Secretary of State when a, a person passes away and you are the heir of the publicity rights. So that puts the entire world, theoretically, on notice that if they want to use the uh, publicity rights of your uh, deceased husband that they've got to contact you and get a permission. It's a relatively straightforward form that you, that you submit. Your son. Okay. Whoever the, yeah, whoever the heir is, the legal heir, right, would be able to continue to enforce those rights in California. Um, other states have similar kind of registration uh, requirements, uh, but not all of them, but you should you know, just make, just make yourself familiar with the law in the particular state that you're dealing with. Which one? I don't, I don't remember that one, but, you know, a lot of times people bring cases and they, they, it generates some publicity, but it gets resolved and, you know, for a lawyer like me, unless it results in one of these kind of published, pronounced decisions by the court, you know, and I may not be aware of it, and you know, a lot of people may not be aware of it. <laughs>